I'm David Berlin, Editor-in-Chief of Programmable Web, and I'm here with the eighth part of an 11-part video series on APIs 101. Now, this series is designed for those of you who don't know a whole lot about APIs but want to get smart really quickly so that you can hold a conversation with just about anybody, software developers, API providers, anybody who's really interested in the API economy. We're covering a lot of basics here, some fundamentals. It's really for a beginner to intermediate level. If you haven't watched the other seven parts of this series, I strongly encourage you to go take a look at those before looking at this one because we do cover a lot of ground that will be useful in understanding the content of this particular video. So, just to rehash, this series covers six major points. What are APIs and how do they work? Why you should think about investing in an API program, becoming an API provider. How to productize APIs, that's a very important uh, uh, subject and we're going to be talking about that in this video. How to secure APIs because APIs are a technology that you put onto a network in most cases and when you put something programmatic like an application programming interface onto a network, hackers love to hack at it. So you have to figure out a way to keep them from exploiting your APIs in a way that could damage your company or hurt your customers. Why is API first design important? API first design is a uh, methodology towards designing APIs. We will talk about that in this video as well. And then we'll get to it later when we show you how it's done and we consume APIs with a hands-on component at the very end of the series. Now, in review, we talked about a lot of different issues throughout the previous seven segments of this series. Namely, we talked about how APIs are, in fact, user interfaces. They're just built for a different type of user than you or me. We're used to working with our smartphones and our desktops through an interface that we know and love and that is easy to use for us because our eyes and our fingertips and our ears are telling us certain things. Well, machines have a very different need and therefore they have their own user interface. We call that the API or the application programming interface. But it's really no different. It's just another machine talking to a computer as opposed to you talking to a computer. Now, we talked about some analogies in the real world that make it very easy to understand APIs. We talked about Legos and shipping containers and the electric socket that's in the wall and the contract that's a part of all of those different analogies. The understanding between the consumer of the API or the consumer of a service and the provider of an API, the provider of the service. For example, if the service is electricity, the utility is the, is the provider of that service and if a hair dryer is plugged into the wall, that's the consumer of the service. The contract that's in between, like of the wall socket, is very key to how APIs work. We also talked about how that contract delivers a huge amount of flexibility when it comes to organizations that are looking to transform themselves from slow elephants to speed demons. And then there's the digital transformation piece. This is where you start to kind of reinvent your entire architecture, everything under the hood in a way that makes you more efficient faster and driving cost out. Once lots of organizations start building out these APIs and you get a proliferation of them onto the internet and across corporate intranets, you end up with what we call the API economy. We talked about that already. And then we also went and did a tour of, uh, took a tour of Programmable Web and talked a little bit about how it is we at Programmable Web classify APIs. What are the different types of APIs? What are their architectures, what are their scopes. And finally, we talked about the driving reasons, the four major buckets of reasons to invest in APIs. So now, without further ado, let's talk about productizing APIs. This is very important because we're going to talk about what we call the API life cycle. And for us, and everybody's got a little bit different view on this, but we see eight different phases of the uh, API management life cycle. Now one thing to keep in mind is the API management life cycle is not unlike a software management life cycle. So this is one of the reasons that we have to think about constantly treating an API as a product. There's a whole life cycle to it and it deserves first class citizenship just like any other product in your company. The first phase is, is planning analysis. Then there's design, development, operation, governance, measurement and testing, engagement, and that means engagement with your developer audience, and finally, retirement. These are the eight major phases. Now, they're in no particular order. This is not what they call a waterfall model. Some things take place before others, but there's also a lot of overlap. So, they're not listed in any particular order, but 
this does sort of show the progression, starting with uh, planning and analysis at the very beginning and ending with retirement, so there is some order to it. Okay, first let's talk about the different people and constituents who are involved in the API management lifecycle. You have the API owner, okay? This is the person who's generally responsible for the API as a product and everything that has to go with it. It's like a product manager. You have the IT architect. This is the person that's responsible for making sure that the uh, underlying information architecture, the, the, uh, the technology, and all of the, the different components are working together to drive the, uh, not only the business objectives of the organization, but to make the, IP work, uh, the API work as intended. You have the developer of the API. The, this is a very, once you've decided to go the route of APIs, now you need somebody who knows how to develop them, and that's your API developer. We mentioned already that security is a very critical component of APIs. APIs are programmatic interfaces. Developers, I'm sorry, hackers who are looking to exploit some weakness in your security, they're always looking for programmatic interfaces because they're very scalable and that's what hackers want most, is something that scales, something that can do a lot of damage very quickly. The chief security officer in your company is the person that needs to be in the loop on everything you're doing so that you, he is comfortable, he or she is comfortable, knowing that the, uh, that, that the APIs that you're about to launch and introduce don't compromise organizational security in any way, shape, or form. The service owner, this person is more responsible for overseeing uh, the day-to-day -day operations of all the different APIs. Maybe not hands-on, monitoring, looking at the screens, but they are the, per the person who's like, at the, uh, at, like uh, managing and overseeing the, the running of the APIs. Now, I want to point out something. In some organizations, there are going to be people who share these roles. This doesn't mean that you need all of these uh, stakeholders in your organization, but you need people who uh, take on these roles. So one person may take on multiple roles. For example, the service owner and the service operator may be one and the same person. The service operator, that's the person who's watching the, what's going on with the APIs uh, all the time, getting alerts, acting on those alerts, uh, responding to support requests, upgrading people. If, for example, you have uh, some amount of uh, a limit on the number of API calls that a developer can make, it's something they have to make more. You work with that developer to help get them uh, more API calls or a bigger allowance. Uh, the surface operator is really the person whose job it is to monitor the ongoing operation of the API uh, on an ongoing basis and react to any uh, incidents or events that need, need to be acted on. The API evangelist. It doesn't matter whether you have an, uh, an API that is being internally uh, used for an organization or it's being used publicly or externally, you still need somebody whose job it is to spread the religion about that API. What makes that API great? Why should everybody use it? This is a very important role in the organization. When you build APIs, trust me, you can't just go ahead with the if we build it, they will come attitude. You have to get somebody in the role of, API, of an API evangelist to get the word out, to, to evangelize the availability of the API, to take feedback back into this group of stakeholders in the event that you're getting feedback either positive or negative about the, Phoebe, uh, about the API in a way that allows you to evolve it over, uh, over time to come and make it more useful to its target audience of developers. Of course, speaking of the target audience of developers, you have the API consumers, the developers themselves, the guys and gals that write the applications that you'll be using. So the, when you're launching an API, one of the most important things to do is get that developer involved early on because it's sort of like a testing, like a test market of the API with those, those uh, developers. You want them to feel as though they're a part of the process because then they have a little bit of ownership of that API. So when it comes time to actually finally launch it, there's a greater likelihood of them uh, embracing it. And then on an ongoing basis, of course, they are a very important part of your community and they are a stakeholder because anything you do with that API is going to impact them. Again, these are roles, not necessarily job descriptions. In most organizations, you see that some people might take on more than one of these roles. In larger organizations, you might have people, a one-to-one -one relationship. Okay, let's go into the different phases of the API management lifecycle. 
planning and analysis. This is where you're sitting down and you have an idea for an API. Now it's time to kind of really formulate the vision around it. So this is where the different stakeholders have to get together and talk about the grander vision of this API. What's it going to be for? Why are we doing this? We have to start looking at the different requirements of the API. For example, what is it that the uh, developers will require? They need the APIs, they need the software development kits to make it easier to work with those APIs, sample code. What are the different uh, end user stories that, that might make it easier to understand where the API might come into play? What's going on in, in the market? If this is not an internal API and you're going out into the public onto the internet with this API, who else is doing an API in your, mar in your space and what are they doing? You have to take a good close look at that because you want to make sure that if your API is going to be competing with another one that you offer something that's more better, right? It's got to be something that causes all of the developers that are using your competitor's API to take a closer look at yours. Then also you have to start thinking about how do we build this for longevity? Too often we hear stories about uh, API providers who are going off and uh, build, a, build an API, launch it very quickly, and then suddenly, guess what? They have to change it. And anytime you have to make a serious change to an API, that gets developers very upset because it typically will break their applications. Remember, in the previous parts of the series, we've been talking about that contract. You cannot break that contract without breaking the applications that depend on it. That contract is a common understanding between the API consumer and the API provider. So you don't want to, you want to change that contract as infrequently as possible. Anytime you change that contract, it's a new version. Okay, you also want to talk a little bit about the organizational impact. You know, we talked earlier about the idea of a microservices culture. The, the memo that Jeff Bezos sent out to all of Amazon in 2002. Anytime you start introducing a, an API-led culture into an organization, it's going to have an impact. So you need to discuss that impact and figure out how to best socialize that with the rest of the organization. Then you have to start thinking about, well, what's the business model for this? How are we going to roll this out? Is it going to be public? Is it going to be private? Is it going to be semi-private? Is you know, semi-private could be, well, okay, it's for some partners, but also, also for some uh, so for some external developers. Are we going to have a large set of unknown developers or a small, a small set of known developers? Going back to how we talked about what Daniel Jacobson, uh, who's the director of Edge Engineering at Netflix said. We are going to look at the different service tiers, right? Like maybe there's a free tier. Somebody gets 100 API calls a day or 1,000 API calls a day. Maybe there's another tier that costs some amount of money and another tier that costs a different amount of money. What is, how are you going to organize these tiers or are there going to be tiers at all? These are things that you have to talk about during the planning and analysis phase. SLA, service level agreements. As you get to the more expensive tiers, for example, if you have customers paying you thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars to use your API, those customers are going to have certain expectations that that API is available all the time. They don't want their applications to break because you were unable to provide five nines availability for that API. So service level agreements is something that absolutely has to be discussed during the planning and analysis uh, phase. Security, we've mentioned it many times over. Security is one of those things. We, keep, we, we have a lot of firsts in the API world. You should do API uh, API first design. You should do uh, um, product first. Think about it as a product. Well, you should also have security first. Security is not an afterthought. It has to be thought of as soon as you get started because if you get too far down the road without taking security into account, you're going to end up with a major problem when you hit the finish line. Okay, just a real quick pause here before we go into any the, the next phases. I want to talk a little bit about the basic structure of a RESTful API. This is not a deep dive in RESTful APIs. This is a general pattern. It's not a rule of thumb, just an often observed pattern. When we say the word endpoint, here's what we're talking about. This is the basic root endpoint of an API, for example, HTTPS slash slash API.stripe.com. When we're talking about an endpoint coupled with a version, so maybe there's a multiple versions of an API at a given endpoint, you often will see that version built into the URL of the endpoint, right? So this is just another example of where we have slash v1, which stands for version one, okay? And then what comes after that are the different resources that that API offers. 
could be the balance of a customer or their balance history, could be the charges they've made, could be a variety of things, but this is typically how resources are presented in the form of a web URL when we're talking about web APIs or RESTful APIs. So again, everybody has a different approach to this, but generally speaking, when we talk about endpoints, we're talking about the root URL. When we're talking about a version, we're talking about usually that's presented at the end of the root URL, and then the resources are what comes after that version number, the different resources that are available through that API. Just something to be aware of as we go through this conversation. The second phase of the uh, API management lifecycle is the design phase. And this is where we start to take all those requirements that were established in the planning and analysis phase and start to codify them, document them, get them down on paper and finalize them in a way that everybody knows what direction we're heading. We also want to make sure we understand, have a clear understanding of what the developer, the final developer experience is going to look like, right? Because as you start to build this API, you have to keep an eye on what's that developer experience so that developers have the strongest likelihood of actually embracing and, to, and, to, and using that API in their applications. Then you want to design the API, and again, we've talked many times about this idea of API-first design. We'll get to that in uh, part uh, 10 of this series, the idea of designing APIs with the right tools in a way that you can easily launch them and, and create documentation and other artifacts from them but API first, if you can do API first design, we strongly recommend it. Again, we'll talk about that later in the series. Validating and collecting feedback. I mentioned earlier that as you uh, begin to work on your APIs, you want to include uh, the, the target customer as quickly and as soon as possible in the life cycle. Those are your developers, the API consumers. You want to bring them into the process, get them to help own the process, give you feedback. Let them tell you what's working for them and what's not in a way that during the design phase, you can make the fixes then so that you don't have to come back later and make what we call a breaking change and introduce a new version, a, a problem that will, that something that will cause a problem for many of the developers who have applications already out there consuming an older, maybe less functional version of the API. So, uh, this is where you want to go out there and just make sure you validate everything you do. There are a lot of tools out there that you can acquire to help test APIs. So it's not about just getting feedback from your developers, but it's also about putting various automated tests in place to make sure that everything is working exactly as intended. Okay, You want to start looking at how you're going to draft up your documentation. What is that going to start to look like? Run that by your developers. Make sure they like the documentation you're putting together. They will be very quick to tell you where your documentation sucks. So be sure to get them included earlier because again, they are your target customer. Okay, now let's talk about the next phases, implementing the APIs. Because we just talked about planning and analysis and design. We haven't actually done it yet. We haven't put the API into play. All right, development. So first, we're going to take the output of the design phase, right? We just got done going through planning analysis and design. Now we're going to make it real. So we're going to start to uh, put together the systems under the hood that need to be put together in order to drive the API. In many cases, the data that's, that's coming through your API may come from multiple systems. You might have to integrate those systems in some fashion to deliver the final uh, API information that's coming from the API. You have to make decisions about whether or not you're going to drive this API through on-premises uh, infrastructure or using the cloud. You're going to have to decide which vendors are going to be involved in this implementation. You know, the API, if you take a look at, you look at the API itself, the endpoint and everything that's behind it, there's an entire stack of software behind it. And those decisions have to be made. Are you going to use something that's existing in the organization? Are you going to start with something new? What API management products, there are many of them out on the market, might you use to help get you through this life cycle? A lot of choices to be made about the technology here. And then what's your procedure for uh, ongoing uh, API operation and maintenance? Again, this is where tools can come in handy. What tools are you going to be using to run the API, monitor its progress, monitor the users who are, who are accessing it, and then to also take whatever measures have to be taken in order to maintain it. There are some organizations that have built their APIs so that they auto scale. If the demand sort of starts to outstrip the, the, amount of, uh, 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 the, the amount of horsepower you have behind your API, then that API can automatically scale. 
What tools do you have in place in order to make that happen so that your infrastructure dynamically adjusts to the load that's being placed on those APIs? Once those, those decisions are made, you can start to build, build out your API. Now, enforcement points are very important to think about at this point because you're going to start to have a whole bunch of policies around your APIs. I mentioned, for example, the tiers that we talked about earlier. You have different tiers of users. How are you going to enforce that? So you have to think about, well, what technology am I going to have in place or what do I have to build in order to make sure that the people who have a right to use one tier may not have the rights to use the next tier, right? Measurement is really important. One thing I always tell people is, when they ask about APIs, I, my first question to them is, define success. What, how do you know once you've built an API that is successful? And that's a, the answer is different for every organization. But what's, what's not different is you need to put the measurement capabilities in place so that you know whether or not you're succeeding or not. So you want to try as best as you possibly can to quantify success, and then you want to make sure you have the dashboards in there so that you can monitor how you're doing against those objectives. So keep measurement in mind as you start to build. Don't do it later because if you try to introduce measurement as an afterthought, again, you'll be wishing that you, you thought about it sooner in the process. I talked a little bit about earlier, earlier about testing procedures and technologies. This is exactly, you know, there's a lot of technologies on the market. For example, SmartBear makes uh, some technologies for doing uh, ongoing testing of your APIs to make sure that they are performing well, that they are secure, uh, that something hasn't been introduced to compromise the security. So it's very important that you're always testing your APIs, whether you're in the design phase or in the ongoing operation, to make sure that nothing has gone wrong. API operation, that's our next phase here, okay? And the operation is what's going on on an ongoing basis. So, for example, how, is, how are you maintaining and monitoring the security of your APIs? Uh, if there's any orchestration that has to be taking place uh, with your APIs, what is the infrastructure that is, is running that orchestration and how do you monitor which to, uh, how the orchestration is going? Are, things ha are, are certain processes firing at the right time? Are, are, there, are they waiting for something else that's too slow? You're going to need to understand that uh, as an ongoing part of operating the API. Scaling, ha again, how do you adjust uh, automatically to uh, sudden uh, growth and demand for the API from developers. Uh, what are the different tiers? Uh, maybe scaling, maybe some tiers scale better than others. Maybe uh, you have to monitor uh, the certain tiers that have service level agreements attached to them to make sure that you don't violate those SLAs. How are you going to manage that? What DevOps do you have in place to make sure that scaling happens exactly when it should happen? And on Programmable Web, we talk about DevOps APIs all the time. These are APIs that can automatically provision and deprovision infrastructure on the basis of the load that's being placed on infrastructure. How are you going to manage your users, your developers? How are you going to issue them IDs? Because generally speaking, you're going to want to monitor them as well. And the easiest way to monitor what developers are doing is to watch their activity based on their identification, their client ID. How are you going to bill them? How are they going to pay? These are all things you need to think about as part of the ongoing operation. The next phase is governance. Okay? Now governance is that bit of, well, we've got policies about these APIs. Policies in terms of what the, what the API has access to under the hood of our, of our uh, information technology, but also based on the user coming in, what they have access to through that API. Depending on the tier of access or depending on the type of user, they may have different levels of access to different information going through the same API into your infrastructure. This is where policies come in handy and governance is very important. A lot of technologies out there that maybe you're familiar with that help you manage that already. But now you have to connect that up with your API. Policy layering. Policies, you may establish a bunch of policies for, let's say, um, who has access to your certain APIs and when, but when you start taking those policies and combining them, then it becomes a little bit trickier. So somebody has to be very knowledgeable in the area of taking multiple policies, sometimes that conflict with each other, and figure out a way to resolve that. Managing API access, of course, we talked about that in the last phase, but once developers have access to that, access to that API, how do you revoke that access if you have to? Um, how do you reinstantiate it once they're back in your good graces? You never know, but the, uh, managing access is not a one-time thing. You don't just give somebody access to your API and that's it, it's over. 
You have to manage it on an ongoing basis. Maybe you have groups of users and you have to figure out which developers go in which groups and maybe those groups have different uh, rights to different resources beneath your API. There are all sorts of different enforcement points for getting these policies into place and managing the access. You have API keys, you have rate limiting and thro throttling. This is an, an example of that is where for some API consumers, well, it, you have either a certain number of API calls you can make or maybe a certain number of API calls you can make over a given period of time. That's throttling. So this may be connected with the different tiers of service you offer. You have user level security, right? So again, what, depending on the user or what group they're a part of, what resources they have access to and how do you enforce that. You have the application security. Maybe a user of one application, automatically that determines the fact that they can't get to certain resources, but a user of a different application, they do get access to a resource based on the application's identity. And of course, access control, which is uh, not it's very common amongst large organizations in terms of doing things like with Active Directory. There are plenty of um, uh, organizations who figured out how to map their access control, which is managed through Active Directory, into their APIs. Measurement and testing. Okay, so I mentioned that earlier. You really cannot uh, run an API without ongoing measurement and testing of it. For no other reason than you've identified what success is, now you've got to know if you're achieving it. But there's plenty of other things to look at. Obviously, key performance indicators, business objectives, that's the first most important one. Scaling up. At what point do you actually scale your API? Whether it's automated through a DevOps API or you're doing it by hand, however it is you're doing it, at what point do you throw more horsepower at that API? Well, you have to be measuring something to know that. So you have to have the measurement and the dashboards in place to know when that point of scale, uh, when it comes time to scale to the next level. Um, you also might want to know when you've uh, outrun the capabilities of the underlying system. So maybe at some point, that's it. That system's not going to be able to scale any further. Now it's time to consider ripping and replacing that system with something else that can better provide the API at scale and performance. Again, going back to everything that we've discussed in this series of videos, that's one of the great things about APIs. Because if the contract between the API consumer and the API provider stays consistent, if you don't change that, it makes it possible to rip and replace the infrastructure in a way that gives you more horsepower without impacting negative impact, negatively impacting, I should say, any of your API consumers. In fact, it will positively in, uh, influence them because they will actually see better performance in their applications. And then there's transparency. You want to be transparent with your entire organization, with your end users, with your developers, about how the API is working. There are lots of uh, examples, for example, Salesforce, where they have uh, trust.salesforce.com. They're constantly advertising the uptime of their infrastructure in a way that establishes trust. And so transparency with the various stakeholders is very important because that engenders trust and it makes them uh, more, uh, more, more likely to embrace your APIs and use them in their software. Ongoing testing, very important issue. You want to be able to continue to test your APIs, we talked about it as a part of the operation phase. You want to do regression tests, you know, so that any changes you're making are not introducing some sort of breakage to uh, an existing API. You want to constantly be testing for performance to make sure that the API is achieving the levels of performance that all of your end users expect, especially if that's part of a service level agreement. Okay, one of the most important parts of the API management lifecycle is engaging developers. And this is like an art. Right? This is, there's so many aspects to engaging developers. We're just going to go into uh, uh, two columns worth of them here, but there's probably twice as much, if not three times as much, uh, content to go over. Okay, developer marketing, very important. Once you've decided who it is you're targeting, uh, you have to decide then how it is you're going to go after them. Are you going to gamify your APIs? Are you going to set up hackathons? What are you going to do about intellectual property? Okay, you know, developers who are using your APIs, you're going to make it so that your API is so open they can reproduce your APIs and, and use them else, use those, those designs elsewhere. These are all important pieces of develop, developer marketing. Onboarding, how is it that you're going to get developers to start using your API? How do they get the credentials? How, uh, what, what automated system do you have in place? Or what uh, forms do they have to fill out to become a partner to your organization if it's a partner API? How do you assign tiers uh, based on their level of engagement with you? 
What are the dashboards that are available to the developers so that they can get an idea of how the API is functioning, what its performance is, it's, uh, it's the degree to which it's available. Uh, how do developers get access to your beta programs? Developers love beta programs, and, and that's one of your key ways of getting feedback when you're starting to build out a new API. And a beta version is just one of the many versions that you will be operating once you get into a full-blown API lifecycle. Everybody runs beta versions for the new next version of the API. What software development kits are you going to offer your developers? Are they in job, for JavaScript, are they for Java? Are they for Node.js or Python or Ruby? You have to decide how you're gonna build these software developer kits to make it easier for developers in each of those languages and which languages are, are important to consume your API. Some API providers, some languages are more important than others. It's different from every API provider to every API provider. You have to decide for yourself. Documentation, well, so much has been written about documentation on the web it's hard to really expand on that here, but there's some really key points to documentation that everybody should know. There should be code samples, there should be tutorials, you should have a showcase of some of the best applications and implementations of your API. There should be an interactive console so that without even writing an application, people can interact with your API and see how it works. There should be mock versions of the API, ones that uh, don't necessarily deliver real data, but maybe deliver some, um, some mock data so that people can just experiment when they develop an application, uh, they can experiment with the mock data. Uh, how is it that that documentation is discovered on the internet? So people are like looking for information about a travel API, what have you done in your documentation to make it so that when they start that search on Google, they end up on your pages if you're a travel API provider? Do you have a change log so that people can go back and see what's going on, what, do, what changes you're making to the API? They can drill back in time. They can be notified using the change log with some, you know, maybe RSS, maybe using an RSS feed that's attached to the change log in a way that everybody, get, everybody gets notified when some change is being made. A security primer. I think this is one of the most important things that most API providers overlook. How to develop secure applications, whether they're web apps or mobile apps, how to do that securely with your API. The last thing you want to have happen is have a developer compromise your API, right? That's not, that's not a good thing. So you need to really figure out uh, how to get your developers on board with building secure applications. And also, how do you build great status codes so that when the API is functioning within the context of some application software, there's a whole good strong list of status codes to give the developer a machine-oriented way of knowing whether the API worked or it didn't work, what went wrong, all sorts of things like that. That way, the, the, the application can respond very dynamically to however it is the API itself is responding. And then evangelism. How do you get that word out? Again, I said RSS feeds earlier, maybe for your change logs. Do you have blogs? Do you have forums? Take Uber, for example. They use uh, Stack Exchange as the place where all of their developers are having the conversation about the Uber APIs. They're using Stack, Stack Exchange, the Stack Overflow part of Stack Exchange, as the destination where that conversation takes place. Emails. How are you staying in touch with your developers over some sort of email infrastructure? Social media, Twitter accounts, Facebook accounts, all of these are very important. I think you're getting the picture now. We keep saying that you have to treat your API like a product. There is a lot that goes into running an API. Last phase, versioning and retirement. Now, the versioning and retirement phase, believe it or not, we've discovered out in the wild lots of different versions of the same API. A beta version, a production version, the migration version, the, su the support, you have to think about all of these issues when you've got multiple versions in the market, right? So the beta version is the one that's the test version, the production version is the one that actually everybody's using for real in their applications. You're gonna have to deal with how you get people to migrate from one to the other. You have to figure out what degree of support you're gonna provide for the different versions that you have in the marketplace. All of these things have to be considered as a part of the versioning and retirement. And eventually, you will retire your APIs. And that's the point at which you have to move existing application developers on to one of the newer production versions. What about backwards compatibility? What about deprecation? When you finally decide to deactivate an API, what is your strategy? How do you go about doing that? These are all things to think about. And then finally, what happens when you actually shut the API down? 
We see so many different versions. Like for example, there may be a version of an API that's still functioning, but unsupported, just so it doesn't break certain applications. Those developers are kind of out on a limb right now, right? But what happens when you eventually actually shut that down? Because guess what? You're at that point where it's too expensive to continue to run that API. It doesn't make sense. That's it. We covered the eight phases of the API management lifecycle, something that generally takes years to actually run because you're treating it like a product in a fairly short period of time. I know this has been a long video, but it's a very important part of our series. Again, you have these eight phases, planning and analysis, design, development, operation, governance, measurement and testing, engagement, and retirement on also versioning. So that's the API management lifecycle. In the next and ninth segment of our 11 part video series on APIs 101, we're gonna talk about API security, one of the most important aspects of running an API. Thanks very much and I'll see you in that segment of the series.